Today, the chiefs and I will be providing an update on the increase of gun violence in our city. Uh, while we have seen a 5% decrease in both violent crime and property crime, almost every major city in America is seeing a rise in gun violence. And unfortunately, Seattle is not an exception. Although thankfully, our numbers are significantly less than a lot of cities at this point. But any increase is worrisome. And it's even more so when we look at the communities who are feeling a disproportionate impact of gun violence. I also will address the recent agreement between myself and the city council members to provide significant COVID-19 relief to Seattle communities in 2020 and in 2021. At the same time, protecting our emergency and rainy day funds, as well as my initial decisions regarding the 2020 balanced rebalanced budget. As I've said so many times, the people of Seattle expect us to work together. They expect us to work together to get things done and to deliver the kind of transformative change that this moment in history demands and that communities are asking for. I'm thankful that Council President Lorena Gonzalez and other council members agree and that our work over the last week shows that when we collaborate, we can find common ground. Our city has faced urgent challenges, including a pandemic, a civil rights reckoning, skyrocketing unemployment, closure of small businesses, and a $326 million shortfall in our budget that we need to address, on top of just immense needs in our community. While our challenges are truly unprecedented, our city has led the way in pioneering and supporting so many new programs to address the needs of our residents and small businesses. Since the beginning of March, my administration has shifted quickly and has provided $233 million in direct COVID-19 relief to give direct aid to city residents and businesses. We implemented one of the first in the nation's moratorium on evictions we ensured that our public utilities would not be cut off when people needed them. We've worked with our federal partners, with the state, the county, and philanthropy to stand up a range of benefit programs that complement themselves and help us weather this economic crisis. I know that so many workers and small businesses are without work and without business, and that this time is really tough. We've also worked to provide COVID testing and masks for community. I have to really thank Chief Scoggins who could not be here today because you cannot say COVID testing without looking at the leadership he's provided our city. First, by providing one of the first in the nation testing facilities for first responders by first responders. Then standing up a mobile team to get into our senior centers and now having three city testing programs in different places in our city. We know how critical this is and those testing now count almost 15% the test done in our state. In addition, we've reached agreement with the council to provide $45 million in COVID-19 relief in 2020 and 2021 to ensure that we can continue the kind of relief people need. This also will retain approximately $50.50 million in our emergency funds to address the budget shortfalls and emergencies in the coming budgets. We know that these proven programs have established in communities the relief that they need, including for people experiencing homelessness, renters, immigrants and refugees, and small businesses. We know that having these kind of partnerships is what the city hopes for us, demands from us, and hope we can continue these kind of collaborations into the future. I think the deal we reached on emergency spending is a really important step to show that when we do collaborate, we can work for the benefit of all Seattle. I know that across Seattle, we have so much more that unites us than divides us. But we also know that the problems we face are complex. We have tough challenges, a global pandemic, a failing economy, and a civil rights reckoning. These challenges are complex and require us to work together. We know so many small businesses and renters, healthcare providers, childcare people are looking for where their next check may come from. Many need food for themselves and their families. 
we know that these challenges have to be addressed by collaboration, deliberation, and thought. They can never be solved by a slogan or a tweet. In the coming weeks, I am confident we can continue to partner on issues, even in those places where we may disagree. And it's no secret, there has been significant disagreement in recent weeks between Chief Fast and I and the Council's approach to the 2020 rebalanced budget, specifically as it relates to the Seattle Police Department and the Human Services Department. All summer, we've been looking to collaborate with the Council to find a path forward on these tough issues. The bills I'm vetoing today were passed without the level of collaboration that I think we need, and more importantly, that the city expects of us. But I am optimistic that going forward, we will continue to work together to bridge the gaps. I truly believe that we can and must find common ground on the vision for SPD that has been laid out by Chief Best and I. We all agree that we need to make significant new investments in the black community. We agree that we need to reimagine policing and provide true community safety. More than a month ago, Chief Bess and I announced one of the most significant plans in the nation to reduce SPD's budget in 2021 by 20% by transferring and civilianizing key operations while also cutting expenses. Under Chief Diaz, command staff, and my team, we are evaluating every single function of the Seattle Police Department and every specialty unit to find where can we eliminate where can we reduce? What changes can we make without compromising public safety? Under Chief Diaz and with the community, we are continuing to look at re-envisioning how we scale new programs. So when a person calls 911, they get the help they need. But that doesn't happen overnight. We need to work together and to have a plan. I do not believe the 2020 budget in its current form moves us closer to those shared goals. In fact, the budget as passed by council would offer a few additional cuts or changes, but could mire the city in extended bargaining and even lawsuits that could expand for months, if not years. It also did not sufficiently look at the issues of public safety. And I continue to have concerns with the council's decision to make cuts before developing a plan. We need to know what those cuts do for public safety. How do we cut things if we don't grow the other resources? We need to have alternative programs, but today those programs are not yet in place. There's no plans, for example, for how the city will address encampments and RVs that pose public health and safety risks without the Human Services Department staff to coordinate and lead these outreach efforts that were cut by this budget. There's no plan for how the city will bridge potential gaps in the police response caused if we lose 100 police officers. There's no plan for how we could even accomplish an out of order layoff or the alternative cut one of the most diverse groups of recruits that we've had. And there's no plan that I can support to cut 40% of the salaries of employees who are in the ranks and leadership of the Seattle Police Department, who have valid agreements with our city and who have been working to provide community safety for every part of our city. For all these reasons, I respectfully have vetoed the council's 2020 budget proposal. I've also vetoed the council's proposal to spend $3 million more dollars out of our rainy day fund and to borrow $14 million from a city department for new spending not to cover any gap, but for new spending. I believe each of these bills seek to spend money we simply do not have. It is not the time for council to pull additional millions from the rainy day fund for its own budget to do some unspecified level of grants. Rather, hopefully we can find a joint way together to do joint engagement of the community and the city without depleting a rainy day fund. In addition, not only is the $14 million loan an issue because of our budget shortfalls, the city can't even feasibly get that $14 million out the door by the end of 2020. I issued these vetoes because of the disagreements 
However, I want to stress again, Council President and I have agreed that we will continue our discussions between my office and the Council on how we can better partner, better collaborate to make changes in a thoughtful, deliberate, and consistent way for all the people of Seattle. As we showed throughout the joint COVID-19 relief plan, I remain willing to, to engage and to collaborate. And my office and several council offices continue to discuss ways to bridge these gaps in the 2020 budget. These conversations will continue. I also want to address the very real increase in gun violence that we have seen take place in both our region and in Seattle. While year to date violent crime and property crime are down, I, like Chief Best, Deputy Chief Diaz, soon to be acting Police Chief Diaz, and Fire Chief Scoggins have very significant concerns regarding an increase in arsons, homicides, and shots fired. As King County Prosecuting Attorney Dan Satterberg recently released, there is a 44% increase in fatal shootings in King County and a 16% increase in the number of non-fatal shootings. 73% of those people are people of color and approximately 60% of shootings with victims are outside of Seattle. In Seattle, we have seen some significant arrests in recent days regarding homicides and Chief Diaz will explain those. We've seen though an increase in shots fired since June 1 since June 1, there have been 116 fired incidents in Seattle. That's up from 75 in the same period last year. These incidents have resulted in 33 injuries and six deaths. They cannot continue. We must stop gun violence. We know that enforcement and policing is only one part of the work that needs to be done to do so. We also have to work with trusted community partners who can work both to de-escalate situations and provide alternatives to the criminal justice system. This year, we are investing with 27 different youth programs that are focused on black and IPOC communities that address youth safety, reentry services, and individuals harmed. So far, more than 1,000 young adults have received services, including the creation of a community critical incident response program to prevent and de-escalate these potential incidences. These programs are all community-based and work to disrupt violence, build healthy connections, and find positive paths for our youth in the community. I wanna thank the community-based organizations who've been such a vital part of that work this year including community passageways, Not This Time, and Choose 180, and others. These programs and the connection with community and youth is one reason I am so confident in Chief Diaz. He has spent a career working with young people and community organizations. He's worked to de-escalate many of the recent shootings by working with community organizations and taking a public health approach to this kind of violence. He knows how to build bridges, and create meaningful connections. And he knows that good policing relies on good community relationships. And with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Diaz. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, Mayor Durkin for drawing attention to the reality that amidst demonstrations, protests, and conversations about the future of community safety, crime continues. Before I begin with updates on violent crime and shot fire trends, I would like to announce some very significant developments in three separate homicide investigations within the last 48 hours. On June 19th, Seattle Police Detectives responded to al after human remains were discovered in suitcases on the beach. The King County Medical Examiner confirmed the remains of one man and one woman. Following an exhaustive investigation, detectives identified a suspect, and on Wednesday afternoon, homicide detectives arrested 
62-year-old man in Marion. He was interviewed and booked into King County Jail on two counts of investigation of murder. These remain, this remains an active investigation. In late June, uh, in late July 18, Seattle police uh, responded to a shooting near Pioneer Square where a male victim died at the scene. Yesterday morning, detectives arrested two people, a man and a woman in North Seattle, and following their interviews, the female was released and the 30-year-old male was booked in the King County Jail. And on August 17th, just a couple of nights ago, officers responded to a fatal shooting at a bus stop near 46th Avenue and Aurora Avenue North. The suspect had fled the scene at that time. The detectives were able to identify the suspect through surveillance video. And yesterday morning, officers located the 41-year-old suspect downtown. He was arrested, questioned, and booked into the King County Jail. That's four recent vic uh, homicide victims and three arrests. Because of the tireless efforts of the detectives, patrol officers, SWAT, and forensics work done by our crime scene investigation unit, but I would also like to thank our local law enforcement partners, the King County Sheriff's Office, their TAC-30 team, the King County Search and Rescue, and the Washington State Crime Lab for their assistance in these investigations. Our detectives do incredible work. Nationally, the homicide rate covers around 62% in clearance. In Seattle, we are consistently above 70 and sometimes 90 percent, with an average homicide clearance rate since 2012 of 71 percent. In 2016, we saw 96 percent of our homicide cases. We achieve these high clearance rates because of our dedicated police personnel who work hard and earn the trust of their community. This work does not occur from the hours of nine to five. These investigations take hours and days of work, and they occur 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We will continue our dedication around the clock because these victims and our communities deserve justice. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary patrol officers of our, of our police department. For the past several weeks, they have been responding to 911 calls for service and managing nightly protests many of which no longer are calls for social justice, but instead of, have become direct actions to destroy local businesses and attack officers. Thank you for your dedication to our community and each other. The COVID pandemic has changed our world and what we consider to be normal. This year has been anything but ordinary. And as a result, we cannot compare this year's statistics to any other year. Regardless of comparisons, the amount of gun violence we're experiencing is unacceptable, and I want to address that. Before I get into the numbers in a year-to-year -year comparison, let me be very clear. One incident of violence and homicide is too much. I'm talking about statistics and numbers here, but there is a human being behind each of these numbers. There is a family and a community member that suffers with each loss. The impact of one incident is much greater than just a number. Since June 1st, total shots fired incidences are up 55%, with more incidences of shots fired, more people injured, and the same number of people killed. It is important to note, as the mayor mentioned, many other cities across the country are reporting similar increases in shots fired and gun involved homicides. This is not noted to excuse or explain our local increase but it raises an important question about how we can learn from what is occurring nationally and respond to it locally. SPD and its city partners have worked years for years with community to prevent and intervene in gun violence. I personally have been involved with many of these organizations working to stop violence on our streets and connect young people to supportive services. These groups give young people hope they give them the alternative to street violence. And we need groups like this to prevent crime because SPD would rather prevent crime than investigate violence. We are working tirelessly with our federal partners, specifically the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the FBI, and with the U.S. Attorney of Western Washington. 
Whenever possible, our detectives work closely with these law enforcement partners to ensure those individuals who use guns while committing crimes face enhanced federal charges. Last year, we recovered over 1,200 guns from the street. Through July, through July of this year, we recovered 637 guns. What continues to be essential is that we get people who are engaged in gun violence off the streets. Finally, we have to stop the shootings, the injuries, and the dying right now. Our entire department works with community leaders to address the underlying social issues that lead people feeling the need they need to carry a gun to be safe or to be respected. But clearly, we need to do more. We will collaborate with community organizations to ensure that those who are most at risk to experiencing violence are connected to services and know that the community wants them to stop the shooting and also stands ready to help them. We will not tolerate anyone putting the community at risk by using a gun. This violence only leads to more violence and more people getting injured and killed. We need the entire city to come together and end gun violence. It is my honor to ask my friend Chief Carmen Bess to provide a few words. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm here for what will likely be my last press conference, sadly, uh, for uh, the city of Seattle. But I just want to, to uh, say a good, a few words by my good friend, uh, Chief Adrian Diaz. You know, he has a reputation for standing up for public safety. And I know that he is ready to engage in the hard work of re-envisioning community safety with a solid plan for, tra for transitioning some of the work that we are asked to do by other, to other organizations. First, let me begin by thanking and acknowledging the amazing men and women of the Seattle Police Department. Whether you have been on the department for 30 years or just three months, your service to the people of the city, your courage, your professionalism, and compassion do not go unnoticed. I know that Chief D is here, will support you every day in every way possible, through the tough times and through the easy times, every time in between. It is truly the honor of a lifetime to have been your chief. I am turning the baton over, uh, and as I move toward retirement, I want to talk about my friend and colleague, Adrian Diaz. I have known him for a very long time. He's a leader, he's a mentor, an incredible husband and father, three beautiful children, Alex, Gabby, and Zach. I know them all. They're great little kids. You know, you've done a great job there at home. You've done a great job with the department. And I'm excited, absolutely excited uh, for the future of this organization. And Mayor, thank you uh, for your leadership and for your veto today, which was so important moving forward. Her incredible leadership has been unsurpassed, and I feel like it's been such an honor to work with you and work for you. I ask all of you, officers, Seattle residents, politicians, activists, demonstrators, everyone, please give Chief Diaz your support and your energy. We all know that transformative change is needed. We need to move toward action and leave behind the violence that has happened so frequently in recent weeks. We need to heal. Please support Chief Adrian Diaz. Give him the chance that he needs. I am absolutely confident. I'm actually thrilled to see you take on this leadership role. You've been amazing for so many years, working so hard in the trenches every single day. Support him, support each other. Let's make sure that we have good community safety going forward. Now I'm going to turn it back over to our main legend. Thank you, Chief. Nope, not yet. I think I am. No, no. Oh, <laughs> so I can't let the, uh, Chief Bess and I have, we talk probably every day, multiple times a day over the last year since I've had the honor of serving with her. In the last three months, I don't think there's gone a, any part of any day 
We've had many, many press conferences in this room and the EOC over at SPD headquarters. Today being the last day is really bittersweet. It's sweet because Adrian Diaz is going to be just a remarkable chief. But it's sad because it is the last time I will stand with Carmen Best as our chief. And I wanted to note that by giving her some flowers. Oh, as the you. first token. Yeah. Uh, thank, I love that. Thank you for all you've done. Um, it only doesn't even come close to the great service you've provided to our city, to me, and frankly to our country. So thank you for all your kindness, your wisdom, your perseverance, and there'll be a retirement party. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I still appreciate it. All right. Now you can go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chief. Thank you. And if there's any questions on the line. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. Um, so I want to give everyone just a quick reminder uh, that we will be doing follow-up questions today. I will be muting and unmuting your microphones uh, for both the initial question and the follow-up question. Uh, the audio uh, experience is a little bit different today, so I'm going to ask everyone to please uh, hang in there and be patient. We'll troubleshoot as we go if we need to. Our first question today will be coming from Essex Porter, Cairo 7, followed by Matt Markovich, Como New. Essex, your uh, floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, could you explain the difference between being able to get an agreement on the relief program, but not being able to get an agreement on the police budget? And what's it going to take to get an agreement on the kind of reimagining of the police services that you would like to see? So that's a great question, Essex. I think in the last week, um, frankly, after Chief Best announced her resignation, um, there's been a lot of deep thought in every part of the city about how we need to come together. And I think that uh, enabled council to sit down with us in a very collaborative way to think about how, what in the COVID relief package that we, they originally passed was over 80 million. And by today's agreement, we'll be spending 20 million this year. I think we'll have the same kind of discussions going forward. Um, the reasons that I vetoed the bill are clear, and what I said before is eliminating the navigation team with no plan, um, doing the uh, very, I thought, retaliatory salary cuts of Chief Best and her command staff without collaboration, and, and just uh, saying we're going to cut 100 officers without having a plan. So I'm hoping that those are three things that we can bridge the gap on. Um, and we'll, the, I was able to speak to Council President Lorena Gonzalez. She has committed to continue the discussions on that and the other fronts. And we hope, frankly, that at the end of these discussions, we will have a common engagement plan that the City Council and uh, my office and myself will, will reach out to community and have a participatory budget process so that we all hear the same thing um, and, and are able to take that back and, and think about, as a city, how do we move forward to actually lead the nation on reimagining policing, providing alternative community resources, and deeply, deeply investing in the black community and communities of color. Essex, follow-up? Yes, my follow-up yes. is for uh, Chief Diaz. Go ahead. Did the earlier indulgement of the top Chaz zone embolden others who now we're seeing those crimes? And if so, how do you repair that damage? I'm sorry, it, it captured the whole the whole question at the very beginning of it. Yes, I, I wondered if the earlier allowance of the chop zone on Capitol Hill has now emboldened others, the people who are now involved in crimes in the last few weeks? And if so, how do you repair that damage? You know, right now we're, we're doing a variety of different uh, meetings in the community, meeting with a variety of different groups. Uh, one of the uh, actual demonstration groups has reached out. I have agreed to meet with them and have uh, an open dialogue and discussion. Uh, so I think hopefully we can come uh, to, to some understanding of each other and some learning and experiences so we can then figure out how do we be efficient policing and how do we make our community safer? Because at the end of the day, that's what we all want for, for this city. Thank you, Chief. Our next question will come from Matt Markovich, Como News, followed by Anna Scott, Cairo Radio. Matt, the floor is yours.
Matt, go ahead. Yeah. I was, it says mute on my end. I don't know if you can hear me. So, we can. Okay. Sorry, the questions are for my, uh, the mayor. Mayor, you said that you know, the council had no plan to uh, address the NAV team. You're real specific about the three or four items involving the SBD. So where is that common ground? Which side is going to give? It, and could these matters be pushed into 2021 so the council has an out in a way that they don't have to commit to that 50% uh, budget cut? So Matt, um, if you look at what the council did, the majority of cuts that were made in SPD were the ones that Chief Best and I identified um, after a very deliberate process. Uh, the additional cuts were ones where we felt that they were micromanaging the management of the department and identified cuts that either weren't possible or were wise. They've agreed to sit down and talk about those things, and I'm hopeful that we will have that engagement. On the navigation team, we have to have a plan. Um, we know I've had, <clears throat> excuse me, I've had uh, open houses with a number of community and neighborhood groups in the last weeks. And the impact that some of these um, encampments are having are real. And they also are real for the people who are living in those encampments. We have to have a way to bring people inside and to address those encampments that have either a public health or public safety danger. The cuts they did don't allow that. So I'm hoping that they will sit down and work with us in recognition that every one of them represents people in the city of Seattle who want that same result. My, and my follow-up is pushing it to next year. Do you see that there could be a scenario where some of these budget discussions, since you're so close to just you know creating the 2021 budget, that some of these issues will be pushed into next year? So I think that first, as you know, I have to give my budget to council in about a month's time. So we right now are making those decisions and the council has until November. I'm hoping we can reach agreement on the structure of all these hard decisions. But the engagement we need to do with the city of Seattle has to go into next year. If we wanna have meaningful outreach and listen to communities, it can't be microwave. We have to really take the time to do that. And that will inform us, what does the community need? How do we stand it up? And how does that work with policing? So that work will have to continue into next year. Thank you, Mayor. Our next question will come from Hannah Scott, Ira Radio, followed by Justin Carter, Capital Hill, Seattle. Hannah, the floor is yours. Hi, my first question is for Mayor Durkin. I'm wondering, King County Equity Now recently made an additional, de an additional demand for you and the City Council to, in this full participatory budget process, make sure that you must allow them to direct the $100 million that you've pledged to reinvest in communities of color, that they're the ones who get to say where that goes, not the city or the mayor. What do you say to that? So I've made it very clear from the beginning that the community, and I will say community by being larger than just any one organization, will be at the table helping us decide what they need and how we get there. And hopefully in the coming weeks, I will be announcing exactly the process for how we're going to accomplish that. But it will be community-based, and community voice will guide us. Follow up. That was injured in last weekend's riot who described morale as, as low among the officers and as officers feeling abandoned, alone uh, by, by city leadership. What will you do to help boost that? It's a great question. And I've actually talked to both Chief Best and Chief Diaz about what I as mayor can do and what the city can do. Um, I think that we want those officers to know that we still need policing and we need them to do their jobs. And I've seen them in many, many difficult situations serving for the public good. Um, we need to reimagine policing for communities, but that doesn't mean there aren't times and situations where we absolutely need traditional armed police to do a response. When we talk about the increase in gun violence, um, police are part of the answer to that. The, as Chief Diaz showed, our investigations by the police department, those tireless investigations, were able to arrest suspects and bring closure for the families and victims. So there are many roles that we need the police. And I say to every police officer, I don't want you to uh, give up. We need you in the city. Thank you, Mayor. Our next question will come from Justin Carter, Capitol Seattle, followed by Evan Bush, Seattle Times. 
Dustin, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, so I'd like to follow up on Hannah's question. Um, the the King County Equity Now and Decriminalize SPD um, uh, ask is for $100 million uh, to be made available uh, for public uh, safety budget participatory uh, budgeting process. So can, are you saying that, that you're committing to a participatory budget process um, but you aren't ready to put a dollar amount on it, uh, or is it going to be something at the scale of around $100 million? million? Actually, it's a none of those things. I announced many months ago that I was committing to $100 million of new community investments and that we would have a process so those investments would be guided by community and the voice of community. King County Equity now wants to be the deciders in that. We will have those voices at the table, but we will have a broader process. Yeah, a uh, different topic. Um, can you, Mayor, can you tell us, uh, have you discussed the possible compromises or this environment of compromise that's coming now with the city council? Have you discussed that with the, the police union SPOG leadership at all? And if you have, um, what can you tell us about how those discussions have gone and, and uh, what those discussions are, are like at this point? I've not had any discussions with the police union or SPOG. Um, but a number of the things that I'm talking to city council about don't have to be bargained. Um, they're more about how do we approach this in a collaborative fashion and something based on facts and a plan. So I'm hoping that moving forward, we will be able to have the kind of deliberation and collaboration that is more thoughtful than perhaps what has happened before. Thank you, Mayor. Our next question will come from Evan Bush, Seattle Times, followed by David Roman Prospect. Evan, the floor is yours. Mayor, when you uh, reimagine policing, um, do you imagine uh, when it comes to personnel, a smaller department in the future? I don't prejudge that. If you look at police departments, um, not just across the country, but in other countries, when they've actually reconfigured policing and what the responses are, including, for example, uh, Newark, which is a uh, Camden, I mean, which is held out. They ended up at the end of the day with a larger department, but with the duties optimized and with a stronger uh, community resource. So I, my guess is you end up with a smaller department, but, my, but you also may have a larger patrol contingent. Um, and you may have unarmed police officers like community service officers who are either in the police department or in another entity. What is clear though is if you have alternatives to that, whether it be social workers or crisis intervention specialists, family counseling specialists, you have to identify what you need. Then you have to hire and train those resources. That takes a remarkable amount of time and thought. Um, just looking at us standing up the Health One program, which I think is a great program that shows how you can center wellness and a public health response. It took time, it took resources, um, it works. But to bring it to scale is going to require a commitment from the city. Sure. Uh, following up uh, for for Chief um, for Chief Diaz, um, I'm wondering uh, to what you attribute uh, the rise in in gun violence, and if you wouldn't mind repeating some of the statistics, um, the the video feed cut out for me. Yeah, we can also send it to you. Uh, but I, I can tell you that uh, shots fired have. Uh, actually been raised uh, from June 1st, 55% of calls and uh, 55% increase. What we've also had is 116, I think the mayor noted 116 shots fired from that same time, from June 1st uh, onto where we're at today. And so these are just some basic numbers. Uh, right now we are evaluating why, uh, why gun violence has, has uh, actually risen uh, across the nation, but also locally. Uh, the first about a month, we actually had five homicides uh, within the first month. So we started off uh, at a fast pace. Uh, we slowed down for a little bit and we've already started to pick back up uh, during the summer months. During the summer months, this is, uh, it is routine for us to see a, an increase, uh, more people out and about, but we're also dealing with a pandemic. And so uh, thinking that more people were gonna be more at home, uh, that hasn't been the same, the same case. So we're right now evaluating all the reasons of why gun violence has risen, uh, if there is any pattern to it, if it's related to you know gang violence or if this is related to youth violence or if this is related to 
you know, maybe an increase in domestic violence. So that, those are all things that we're evaluating uh, daily to figure out how we have solutions to address the issue. Thank you, Chief. Next question will come from David Croman, Prosca, followed by Eric Barnett, CSM. David, the floor is yours. Yeah, Mayor, um, it's sort of related to Evan's question, I suppose, but in the spirit of compromise, um, would you entertain, you know, deeper cuts than what you originally proposed to Seattle Police Department, if it was perhaps somewhere between what you originally proposed and what the City Council is, what you are vetoing today? Yes, um, and I think if it was based on an analysis of one, could we really do it, which many of the cuts that they proposed, like the layoffs, we can't do, um, and regardless of whether it would be wise, and what the plan would be to achieve that. So, as I said, before they passed the budget, if they had simply said, we're going to cut an additional amount, we wouldn't have had as much of an objection. It was that they targeted the chief and her staff salaries, that they targeted the navigation team, and then they used, a, you know, budget devices to kind of manage within the, the department itself. I think that's the wrong way to go. So, I think that we can sit down and that there could be a compromise on that front. David, follow-up. Yeah, sure. Um, for, for Chief Diaz, um, I'm, I'm curious uh, to put you on the spot a little bit. I, I'm curious, are you interested in the permanent police chief's job? Uh, I, I, the way I look at it is this, is that I didn't ask for this job when things were going easy and uh, calm. I'm, a, I'm actually doing this job when the things are the most difficult times, the most challenging parts of our department. So yes, I am interested in leading this uh, department through its roughest times and then into the future as well. Thank you, Chief. Our next question will come from Eric Barnett, CS for Frank, followed by Paul Keeper, writing for the South Seattle. Erica, the floor is yours. Hi, this is a question for Mayor Durkin. Um, I, uh, and I'm sorry to keep hounding you on this when everybody's asked about compromise, but I, um, you mentioned a bunch of things that are sort of non-negotiable and I know you're, you've been talking to the council president. Can you talk about something that is negotiable in the uh, in the package that um, that you just vetoed? Is there anything that you're willing to bend on? I want to hear what their proposal is, Erica. Um, I think we laid out pretty clearly the reasons why uh, some of the things they did uh, were not uh, would not survive a veto. But I think now we're in a position where people are actually collaborating and discussing on what, how you implement cuts, what the reality of those cuts are, and what impact they'll have on community safety in the city. So as long as we're grounded on real results, um, I'm, I'm willing to have those discussions. follow up. Yeah, um, you mentioned the um, the seventeen million dollars in spending. I think it was three million on um, on participatory budget research, and then uh, another fourteen million on HSD and community groups. Um, it, can you talk a little more about why you objected that particular um, portion of the budget? Yeah, there were two separate um, bills. The three million dollars represented a seventeen percent increase in the council's own budget. They took that money out of the rainy day fund at a time when we need the rainy day fund to prepare for the coming budgets as well as emergencies. Um, also, because of the nature of the participatory budget, it was not outlined how that money was going to be spent. Um, and some of those contracts were contracts that traditionally would be uh, not granted in that fashion. But in conversations with the council, we're hoping that we can agree on an outreach program of participatory budget process and task force it would take whatever spending we need, and I think it has to be needs to be far less than that, and move forward. We need to center community voice. I believe those community organizations have to be involved and have to do part of the work in community themselves and bring that back. Um, but I felt that $3 million coming out of the Rainy Day Fund at this time um, for a process that at that time did not have the kind of results that I think we need is not the path to go. On the $14 million, look, it's, it's a... It's a loan that I'm not sure we can repay. And we know coming in the coming budget that we will have to do some interfund loans to just keep the city services we have. We can't afford to use that for new spending, let alone new spending that we could not maintain in the years to come. Thank you, Mayor. Our next question will come from Paul Kiefer, writing for the South Seattle Emerald, followed by Natalie Graham, stranger, and that will be our last one. Paul, the floor is yours. Hi, hi, St. Paul, different outlet today. Um, to, to start, may I start with uh, the Chief Diaz? Yep. 
Alrighty, thank you. You can end with them too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That will not happen. But um, in any case, uh, Chief Diaz, could you speak to how the pandemic has impacted SPD's standard practices for uh, preventing gun violence or preventing homicides in general? You know, uh, right now we've actually you know had probably less people uh, on the streets from around March you know third, whenever the pandemic really kind of uh, started to to come about. Uh, and we've we've been actually still actively patrolling, uh, still staying active in that. It's really uh, as around as you know uh, when George Floyd uh, was murdered. Uh, I think May 27. Uh, the demonstration started around May 30th, and then since June 1st, we've seen this really huge uptick in the amount of uh, gun violence. We've been having since that time. We've been balancing our workload between uh, 911 responses as well as uh, dealing with the demonstrations. And so that is you know, what we're trying to, to balance and really sit, spend our time focused on our actual response to, to the call for service and doing work on the preventative side to prevent uh, gun violence. Paul, well, follow up? Yeah, and the second one's for the mayor. So uh, sorry, Mayor Durkin, to bring you back, but. No problem. So all right. So as you envision this, you know, potential participatory budgeting process uh, unfold, would you imagine it resembling the Your Voice, Your Choice, uh, Your Voice, Your Choice program in that it would be housed in a city department? Or can you imagine it being done through a third party? Uh, combination. I want to answer this question, Paul. First, I want to go back. I think I heard a little bit different question you had. I think another way that COVID-19 has impacted our programs related to gun violence is that we have not been able to meet in person and community outreach and community engagement over the last five months has been very, very different than we anticipated it be. Some of that work we do with community-based organizations, particularly through HSD and not just through SPD, really relies on getting into community groups, having those credible messengers themselves have meetings and conferences and, and gatherings. That hasn't been able to help happen under COVID. And so I think that has had a, a big impact on our ability, our normal programs we would have to really engage communities and youth hasn't been able to happen in the same way. I don't know that that is the effect, but that has definitely been an impact. On your question on the, on the process, look, I think the process has to have a couple of different components. Number one, it must center the voices of the most impacted communities. We need to have trusted messengers and community partners reaching into those communities to bring some uh, information and proposals and thoughts back to whether it's a task force or a joint group that the council and the mayor have. I think we also have to have ways to engage all of Seattle. We need to get into every neighborhood and every community because uh, how we do policing impacts every part of our city. Uh, because of COVID-19, it again will be different. My guess is it'll be mostly kind of Zoom-like meetings, but we want to try to find some ways to have other smaller engagements that are appropriately social distance, because I think you get different interactions from people in person than you do on Zoom. So I think it will be a combination of third parties, some traditional, non-traditional outreach, and then some, some additional things that we probably haven't thought of, but some maybe some community-based organizations or council have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Chief. And our final question today will come from Natalie Graham. Natalie, the floor is yours. Hi, thanks. My question is for the mayor. Um, so, Mayor, it seems that this is one of the most contentious mayor-council relationships in Seattle history, with vetoes some unprecedented left and right. Would you characterize <laughs> that way? And if so, why? No, I, I think I've had two vetoes, so I would say that's left and right. Um, with these today, look, I've lived here most of my life and there have been many more difficult relationships in period of times. I'm hopeful that we have a path forward now to actually have some conversations and collaborate. Um, I, I, I've made no, um, I've not hidden the fact that in, through the summer that I and the chief were very frustrated that we did not seem to be able to collaborate with council. Um, they would probably tell you the same thing, but I was particularly frustrated that all of those conversations about the budget happened, the police budget, without ever talking to the police chief. I think now everyone has settled into the, the fact that we know, and I think most of the council would agree, that we are expected by the people to work together. 
And where we disagree, we can talk about it, but we have to have some path forward um, because otherwise the challenges in front of us will never be resolved. Natalie, follow up. Okay, thanks. Um, and would you be able to talk about the timing of this veto? Why now, since it was passed, I believe, on August 10th, and uh, does and we're just about to go into the council recess, so it seems like it might get complicated. Yeah, it's it's the veto. It's you have a certain amount of time for when it's actually transmitted to you, and all these were transmitted at the same time by the clerk's office. And obviously, we've been having some discussion with council. Um, and the timeline by which we have the veto expires Monday. So this was in, this veto was because the bills as passed did not have that type of collaboration that I think we will have going forward and I'm hopeful we have going forward. And there's some flaws in each of these that I hope that the council can correct or with discussions we can find a path forward together. Uh, they have more time to consider it before they have, it's longer than the recess, I think it's 30 days. So I don't think that'll be a problem. Great, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, Chief. Um, that concludes the Q and A portion of today's press. If you have any closing thoughts, now I just want again, um, I want to thank Chief Diaz for being here. I know it's it's not the way anyone wants to come into a job to fill shoes like Chief Best. Um, I again just owe her a great debt of gratitude for all the service she's done through her whole career for the Seattle Police Department. But for as Chief of Police with me as Mayor, I can't tell you how much I've relied on her. Uh, I regret deeply that she's leaving the city of Seattle service, but I know that she will continue to be a strong voice locally and nationally for policing into the future. I wanna thank uh, city council members who were able to sit down in the last week and collaborate with us to come up with an agreed spending plan for COVID-19 relief, and very, very hopeful that we collaborate into the future. I know there will still be disagreements, that's okay, but we have to find a way to discuss it with each other and to move forward. Thank you very much.